Right, so I'm Jonathan Calvary from the Putney Society, which you already know, um, and um, we, uh, we're just a local amenity society, uh, registered charity, and we've been running for about 50 years, and I've been involved for very few of those 50 years. Um, we gradually realised that we had a problem with air pollution in Putney High Street in particular, and it was actually because the council was already monitoring it, they had their own monitoring equipment. Um, and, um, you know, we realised that it was obviously quite bad, the air quality in the high street itself, which is a major through route, and it's also a shopping street. And it's also relatively narrow, and you've got three or four storey buildings on either side, so, you know, the air gets sort of trapped there. So, you know, the, the, the readings, particularly nitrogen dioxide, are, are quite alarming. Um, and, you know, we when we, we became aware of just how bad that was, and we also saw the Mayor's report um, of two or three years ago, which gave an estimate for the number of premature deaths in London per annum. And we worked out what that was on a sort of Putney basis by the different sort of local council wards in Putney. And so, you know, we said, well, look, you know, if these were road traffic accidents, you know, we would be seriously worried about it but you know because it's not a sort of tangible it's a theoretical number then uh, you know people seem to be less concerned but anyway nevertheless we took this up um, and we we're also concerned because Putney High Street had these very high readings we thought you know actually all the streets off it are residential streets so we decided we asked the council you know are you going to monitor any of the streets around where people actually live and they said well no we've got no plans to do that so we said okay well we'll run our own survey and we've been introduced to Mapping for Change uh, who is a super really really helpful organization um, and they provided the diffusion tubes for us so we didn't have to buy these things I didn't realize they were so cheap actually at six pounds each um, but uh, you know we basically got second-hand ones because they can be sort of reused I think you'd put another membrane in or something anyway they provided these things ready to, ready for use and we put them up for a month um, in places all over Putney and um, I'm going to show you one or two pictures of how that uh, process worked. There we are. That's one of my colleagues putting up diffusion tubes and I'll, I'll move that forward because there's a close-up. Um, as you can see they're really quite small and the, the only thing that we were told was, and they've got red tops by the way, not black and white, but it doesn't matter. The thing is you had to keep the top on the top and they were open at the bottom because otherwise it would fill up with water. So you have to remember that. It's got to be that way around. Um, and, uh, you know, we put two at each site. And in one place we put three because we put it next to the council's monitor. We thought we would monitor the monitor. Um, but we put two there because basically if one didn't perform, the other one would. Or you would take a, a mean of the two readings. Um, but they were quite easy to set up. And we, we were given these little plastic straps and a sort of plastic thing to stick them in so you know it was all sort of spoon fed actually all by mapping for change um, and so we went round and we went round lots of locations in Putney and put these things up um, there's one on a lamp post um, I should know it's a drain pipe I think actually um, but you know that's 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 just what we did uh, it was very simple and this is the result this is Putney High Street which comes off Putney Bridge, so it's always very, very busy. That's the Upper Richmond Road, which is also the South Circular, so that's an extremely busy road as well. Um, and these are the readings. The circular ones are the readings from our tubes, and the triangular ones are where the council tubes were. And this is where we did a, a triple check, and our reading for that council, that monitor, was much higher than the council's own reading. I don't know why, but that's how it was. Theirs is in a great big sort of cabinet, so maybe it doesn't get as much ambient air as, as ours did because we just stuck it on the lamppost next to it. So we did, and we put, there were all together about 40 of these things, 40 locations, and two tubes in each location. And you can see over here, prevailing winds come that way, so over here things were okay. Uh, and over here things were okay. That's on the main road. Uh, and all the ones on the main road are, well, it says here 75% above EU standards. I mean, you know, those are really high readings. 
those are the council's own readings because they gave us their statistics and they were given to Mapping for Change in the lab, so they were included in all the numbers. And you can see here, even here, this is just a little side street, which is a bit of a, a rat run. I mean, it gets a lot of um, cars and vans, but it doesn't get any heavy traffic and no buses. But, you know, we still had a very high reading. So, you know, so people living in this area were really very concerned, and quite rightly so. And this here, incidentally, is on Putney Hill, and, uh, and so is that one. That one was actually a little bit further back from the road, and it shows how sensitive these things are to exact location. That's Putney, Putney High School for girls. So it's a major school there. Um, just trying to think. I don't think there's any other schools in the immediate vicinity. Actually, that's, no, that's not true. This road here, see that there, the church, that building there at the corner is a church. And it's got a little sort of infants, you know, one of these sort of nursery places for very small kids. They've built themselves a playground right on the South Circular, which, you know, it's crazy. It's actually opened by our MP who was, at the time when we were corresponding about, you know, problems of air pollution and how you need to protect young kids, they opened a playground right there. It's just in Greening, isn't it? Hmm? Just in Greening, yeah. Just in Greening, that's right, yeah. She was Minister of Transport. I mean, she really should have told them not to do it. Um, we also have one of the other problems about Putney High Street is, apart from all the through traffic, is we get a lot of buses, and this part of this big block here is a bus garage. So we get a lot of buses just going to and from the garage. They're not actually in active service. And this thing here, which says it's above EU standards, this was on a first floor balcony of a house opposite. So if we put it down at road level <coughs> right next to the garage, it would have had much higher readings. So that was one floor up and 20 yards back. So, uh, you know, we thought this was pretty convincing stuff. And we created hundreds of these things, we printed lots of them, uh, and we put a press release out and we sent it to everybody we could think of. We sent it to all the local schools, we sent it to Justin Greening, we sent it to all the councillors, uh, you know, you name it, we sent it wherever we could think of. Um, and, and we sent it to the BBC and the local paper and so on and so forth. And there wasn't any immediate reaction, but eventually we did get a reaction because the local paper started a, a polluted Putney campaign. And this is, you might be able to spot me there with a flat hat on, uh, and a couple of local supporters. And we, we did a little photo shoot. But that was on the front page of the Wandsworth Guardian. Uh, and this was January the 12th, after there'd been a lot of publicity that, you know, you get a, a year's worth of exceedances, as they called, for nitrogen dioxide. You're supposed to have 18 a year when the mean is above EU levels. We, we breached our annual limit within four days at the beginning of the year. So the total for the year, and this is, not, we're talking about 2011 numbers, but 2012 is even worse, was over 2,000 just on Putney High Street. So, you know, we've got a huge problem. Uh, so we, you know, this campaign started and, uh, you know, there was articles about it, quotes from us, and, you know, we got Simon Burkett involved, and he came up with some fairly pithy quotes. That, w that was his wording. Um, and they did a good, you know, we sp spoon-fed some of this information, but there's a little thing about the effects of nitrogen dioxide, the effects of particulates, the effects of ozone. Um, so it was very good coverage. It's unfortunately, very few people read the local paper, unfortunately. Um, so... And this just summarizes what we did. We did this survey, um, we did the press release, we followed up with the council, and the key achievement was because the council had done its own survey, and I've got a copy of it here if you're interested, they knew this was coming because they, you know, we had a public meeting in the April of, and we did the survey in September, we had a public meeting in April, and we had the environment, cabinet member for the environment along. Um, and, so they, and we told them, you know, we're going to do our own survey because we're so worried about this. Um, and they decided they would take their own monitoring one step further. And they put up, for only for a week, they put up vehicle recognition cameras. And they collated that data to the nitrogen dioxide and all the other monitoring that they were doing. And they were able to relate it to vehicle types. So they sent the data off to the... 
Swansea to the DVLA and they said you know these number plates are these types of vehicle and so and this was done by a, a consultancy who've done quite a lot of work for the uh, Department for Transport and, and DEFRA and so they came up with uh, a chart which shows which vehicle types were producing all the nitrogen dioxide and which ones were responsible for the particulates and so on and breaking it down by you know, the number of vehicle movements in the streets. So we got a very, very good... And that was the council's own initiative. They did that. It wasn't our idea. But what it showed was that two-thirds of the NO2 was being produced by buses. And it's, buses were less than 10% of the total traffic volume by, by vehicle numbers. So that's when we, li we lined up with the council and we started beating Transport for London over the head we got our, the mayor's office and we got our local MLA who um, had become seriously interested in this thing and, and the reason he became interested and indeed the council was because there were, this was early 2012 there were the elections in May and so you know we got the timing right in that sense they were all wanting to show that they were going to do something uh, and Transport for London said okay you know we will we are introducing a whole range of lower polluting buses, we will prioritise bus routes which go through particularly polluted areas. And, you know, we had the evidence for, for, for Putney High Street. And so we probably just jumped the queue because they are doing this anyway. But that was really our key achievement was actually, you know, we got TfL to promise that they would upgrade the quality of the bus fleet on all the routes that use Putney High Street. And we've seen the first hybrids. And we had a little photo shoot when the first hybrid showed up. Um, you know, as, as I say, publicity is really, really is the key. So that's what we did. Um, and I think the key issues which I would draw from this, if you're thinking of doing any sort of campaigning, is first of all, the council, they saw all our data, and they said, well, we're not, we can't rely on that. They said, it's not scientifically rigorous. We can't take action. We would have to do our own monitoring in the same way. And they produced some data from spot monitoring that they'd done several years earlier and they said well your numbers are very different to ours we don't think you know we're going to know there's a problem in the high street but not on any of the surrounding roads um, so they challenged us on that and actually the only way that we really got them to take it seriously was because of the publicity uh, you know we hadn't got this into the papers and we hadn't got ourselves on BBC radio and all that um, the council and there hadn't been elections around the corner, the council probably wouldn't have, you know, they would have basically just batted it back and said, look, you know, all very interesting, thank you very much, now you can go away now. Because that was kind of their approach to this whole issue for quite a long time. Um, and the other thing is that, as you know, King's College have got this website, which is very, you know, which covers London, and they get the data from those uh, council uh, monitors in the high street so they get real-time data from these things here. Um, and, you know, we know there's a story every January because the press have picked this thing up now. And so for, for two years in a row, three years in a row, the press have said Putney High Street, most polluted street in London. You know, and of course the council hates it. But it's, it is forcing them to do something because it's a story, you know, we hope, we are, you know, I hate to say it, but we hope that the story will run again 4th of January next year uh, because you know we can push them further in the direction that we'd like them to go uh, and because you know even if we get better cleaner buses it isn't solving the problem because actually what it does it exposes how you know how much is being produced by the rest of the traffic and you know there's a vast amount of traffic using the, using the road um, but, you know, as long as King's College keep producing that data and as long as those monitors stay there and somebody other than the council is paying for them because the council is not paying for them and they don't pay for anything, they can avoid it. Uh, as long as that continues, then that data will continue to, uh, you know, be fed to King's College. Because, uh, I mean, our council is, you know, ruthlessly efficient uh, and very, very tight on the money. Um, and, you know, all the monitoring that's been done has been paid for by somebody else. You know, they've got grants from the mayor or from DEFRA or whoever, but, you know, they don't spend their own money. So I said that the mayor elections were a factor. Um, I, this is the other thing. We had, there was a, 
what was called a, a, an air quality summit, which was held by the council. And a, a lot of people came from the mayor's office. Uh, and we had our MLA. This was before the elections, of course. Um, and, you know, we were there. Uh, and there were lots of TfL people there. And it was a summit. You know, what are we going to do? How are we going to crack the problem? And somebody from the mayor's office, and I think it was Colvia Ranger at the time, you know, who's the environmental advisor to the mayor, he said, well, exemplar status. Now, there's nothing Wandsworth likes more than being given exemplar status for anything, you know, and they got it for all sorts of things, but they would love that for air quality, you know. So, you know, there's a, there's a bit of a carrot there for the council to, to really do something. Um, and the final point, basically, is that, you know, they do emphasize that, you know, it's not in the council, you know, council can't solve the problem by itself. Uh, you know, this is a much wider problem than that. Um, there's a lot of red herrings, a lot of people tried saying, well, actually, this pollution's coming from somewhere else. You know, Boris said it was blowing in from Europe. You know, it's all nonsense. Because you can tell when you look at the readings that they're, that, you know, the worst readings are right on the busy roads. It can't be from anywhere else. It's not the aircraft. You know, it's not, you know, the sewage works two miles downstream or, or any of these. There's all red herrings. But, you know, people have tried that sort of thing. Um, so next steps, just to round this off, um, well, it's, it's, it's actually more difficult. We would actually like to do another survey. I went to uh, a presentation at, um, at Guy's. Um, there were some people there, and there was people from King's College and there were people from, from Guy's, and they've been doing some projects in southeast London, and they had... You may have seen this, it's, it's all available online. They gave people basically like giant sort of wristwatches and it was, it was a PM monitor and they supposed to strap this thing on as soon as they got up and wear it all day. And they gave a whole load of different people these things and they, these things recorded PMs and they had GPS in them as well so they could see where they were and what the PM readings were. And you know, it's a fantastic piece of, of research. And, we, and I said to these guys, I said, we want that. Because we would like people to walk up and down Putney Street and High Street and round and about. And then, you know, we would have a real view of how bad the, the PM situation is. Because the council says you haven't got a problem with PMs. Because their readings are that it's within the EU uh, limits and therefore there's no problem. But, you know, we don't really buy that. And I think... The, the, the particulate matter, yeah. And uh, they're measuring PM10s. And I think these little monitors on this particular exercise, I'm not sure whether it was even smaller particulates, you know, the 2.5s. I'm not sure which ones they were, but, you know, particulate matter is as dangerous, if not more so, than nitrogen dioxide in terms of the, the health implications. So the other thing we're doing, there's the Wandsworth Environmental Forum. We're working with them to keep pressure on the council. We're trying to engage the public health people, the director of public health in Wandsworth, because I don't think that it's linked up. You know, health is now a council responsibility. And I don't people think of thought through, actually, a huge cost in terms of local health issues is actually the results of air pollution. But, we, you know, we haven't really got the council to link that up. And, and the lady who is the director of public health has, you know, agrees that all this is an issue, but it's not on her list of priorities in terms of specifically supporting specific actions. So, and we also need to keep the story alive. Uh, you know, we're finding that hybrid buses are using their diesel engines, so they obviously are still chucking something out. Uh, they're not running on their batteries, necessarily. Um, and we're getting Boris bikes, and we think that's going to play to the active travel uh, agenda, which we're trying to push. We want to get more people using bikes and so on and so forth. So, you know, that's, that's the direction we're trying to push things in, but uh, uh, that's, that's as far as we've got so far. Um, questions? How important was engaging with uh, ones with council beforehand, do you think? Um, we're going in the situation we're in, um, the Greenwich area, we've got the uh, forest planning, the Silver Town Tunnel. So just uh, stick that there. Which Greenwich Council is obsessively campaigning for, yeah. despite the pollution in various areas of the borough. Um, so, how, so Greenwich basically just doesn't engage, and Greenwich is yeah, pretty much hostile. Um, so how important was Wandsworth, dealing with Wandsworth, before putting the tubes up? Before we did that, yeah. before we had our first public meeting on the matter, we wrote a long letter to the council, said we've read the mayor's report, we, you know, mathematically, that means that there are 
you know, in the borough of Wandsworth, I can't remember the exact number, something like 50 or 60 uh, premature deaths per annum in Wandsworth. And in Putney, that is, um, I think what we, we actually worked it out for Putney because we did it by ward. Um, in Putney, it was about, uh, I think, 35 or so. So, you know, we said, look, the serious, you know, even if you question that thing, there's a, there's a serious number of premature deaths. And we wrote to the council, we wrote, we sent all these reports in, said, you know, just in case you haven't seen them, read all this stuff, and what are you going to do about it? Because clearly all your air pollution policies, and they have pages and pages of policies, aren't working. Because, you know, if they were working, we wouldn't have the problem. And, you know, we also knew about the, uh, the readings that were taking place in the high street. And do you know what? We didn't get an answer. We got no reply at all. Now, that was... Um, in July 2010. So, and then we wrote to the TfL, you know, can we have hybrid buses, please? Because we know there's a problem in the high street, and buses clearly part of it. And this was long before the council's own uh, uh, particular monitoring exercise. And TfL wrote back, so we have no plans. So, you know, we were getting a brush off. So we had another public meeting. We got about 60 people there, which is, you know, for, for Putney, not not bad. Uh, and we got Simon Burkett to come along and scare us all to death. And we got uh, the environment, uh, cabinet member for the environment there. And that's when we said, you know, we f found these wonderful people called Mapping for Change. We're going, to do, we're going to do our own survey. We're going to find out how bad it is. And then they started to listen at that point. That was really when they started to listen. When we said, we're going to do our own survey. We're going to see what it's really like. Because we're worried about the residential streets as well as just the high street. So, so that's the answer, basically. It, it, it was quite a struggle. <sighs> Any more questions from anybody? Um, I've got a question. Can I? Yeah, please. Um, how did you decide where to put the tubes? And right. Um, how did we decide? If you come back to the map here, we Could you originally... you that full screen? I don't know how to do that. I don't know how to do that. Um. Yes, I do. Let's go back. There we go. Um, we, we drew up... When, when we engaged with Mapping for Change, we, drew, we just took a map of... took the map of central Putney and said, look, we want the survey to cover all these residential roads here on this side and on that side. We would like to do something that was centred on here because that is the that is one of the busiest junctions in South London because you've got the South Circular and you've got a main route out of London so it's always solid with traffic so we said we want something centred on there so that we can measure all the values in the surrounding roads which are all residential so that's how we choose so you knew where from your own subjective from where the traffic was the main source of the pollution I think we worked out yeah. that the pollution was coming from traffic, right, okay. um, and and we knew we had a traffic problem. We we had a traffic problem for donkey's years, yeah. um, you know. But that was that was, you know, it was it was the readings by the council in the high street that, that sort of triggered all this. Plus the mayor's report about four thousand plus premature deaths. That we, you know that was really what got us focused on on the issue. So did you choose the high street because it was frequented by a lot of people, because it was well known? Um, because I'm just trying to think of some of the retorts that you might have uh, had, like, well, no one lives there, for example. Well, actually, I mean, people actually do live on the high street. I mean, some of the shops along here have got flats above them, but it's, it's a shopping street. It's full of people. If you go there, uh, you know, the, the, site, the pavements are full of people. You know, you've got supermarkets, you've got sh clothes shops, you've got, you know, all the usual things of a high street. So it's a very, very busy shopping street, and it's a very, very busy through road. And it's, you know, it's a nasty combination. Um, and we've had meetings in previous years, we'd had public meetings, you know, what can we do about traffic congestion, uh, you know, without thinking about the pollution angle particularly, but, you know, how do we actually get people out of their cars? you know and onto the buses and you know that sort of thing so you know we we've, we've been aware for a long time that, that it's a big so, traffic so those places were quite cogent and resonated with people because they knew it and yes i mean everybody yeah. who lives in putney uses the high street sure. at some stage 
And you mentioned a school, I think, as well. Or well, there's a Putney nursery. High School up here, which yeah. is a major school right on Putney Hill. Putney Hill is, we didn't carry on the survey in this direction, but I think we would have had the same sort of readings up there as we would have done, because in the mornings, the traffic is nose to tail all the way down the hill, and the evenings, it's nose to tail going all the way up, because further out here, you've got the A3 and Kingston Bypass and so on. So it's, it's an incredibly busy road. I mean, all the stuff that comes down the high street, most of it goes up Putney Hill. So it's the same traffic, and except it's on a hill, it's, you know, so they use even more uh, energy going up there. And, you know, again, these are all residential roads. So there's there's no, no other schools absolutely on a major road, just that one. Because, you know, this is residential and shopping. Uh, there are schools dotted around, but they're on side streets. So, you know, there, there's a couple of schools over here. I think there's one over here, but you know that wasn't the direct concern, at least not for Central Putney. Thanks. Right. So, um, <laughs> I'm kind of struck by the combination of measuring and publicity. And it seems like the publicity was a really important thing in order oh, to get key. the council... It's absolutely crucial. Yeah. So, so what, what's the kind of role of the measuring then? Is it to get the publicity or could you get the publicity in a different way? Like, it, it seems like a combination of two this, different... This map was very powerful. Right. And this is, this is mapping for changes work. Hmm. You know, we could have put out any number of press releases, I think, and people would have just said, OK, yeah, well, we all know there's a problem. But just, just when they see it like that, mm -hmm. you know, with all these big red dots and so on on it then it just brings it home that it's a serious problem. It's not uh, just publicity then, right? I mean... Because, I mean, this, was, this map was used week after week in the local paper. It didn't just the one issue. You mm. know, they kept... Put, every time there was... We, you know, they found enough uh, information to write another article about it. You know, the map appeared. Yep. Council hated it. <laughs> uh, yeah, yeah, I mean, it's yeah. honestly... It's the only way to get, you know, get them to move. Unless there's an election coming up. Well, you know, we have the combination of the two. Um, so, you, um, so TFL would manage the sort of the, the main road there and probably the South Circle. This is, this is a red route. Yeah. This is um, a TFL priority route, which is sort of one step down. So the council says they can't do anything unless TfL agrees. And I don't quite know if that's 100% true. So it's technically it's a council road. Right. It's not a red route. So, uh, but I was they defer yeah. to TfL. So then when they wouldn't change the road layout, for example, without TfL saying, yeah, that's OK. So like, how do I, I, do they kind of play off each other saying, well, we can't do anything because it's TfL or? Well, TfL's priority is uh, to keep the traffic moving. So everything flows from that. Um, you know, we had a, they redesigned this junction here. That's Lower Richmond Road, which is a busy road, um, and then Putney Bridge Road is actually another busy road. So all here has got its own traffic problems as well. They redesigned that junction to make it the traffic flow more quickly. So you know, pedestrians are now sort of hemmed in behind railings, and cyclists are you know at risk more so than they were before at that particular that particular area. Um, so the you know, TfL's priority is always that. Because there was a campaign at one stage to redesign this junction. We wanted one like the one at Oxford Circus, you know, where you, you have a single pedestrian phase and the people can walk, you know, uh, uh, right across. Uh, and, you know, here we have meetings with TfL and they're all nodding, saying, yeah, you know, we'll go away and think about it. And then they completely redid the junction exactly the same way they already was. And now, of course, the argument is, well, there's no money, and we've spent all that money, and we can't change it. And you know, so, so they don't listen much. Right, and there's no political pressure for on them to, you know, take more account of cyclists. Not really. No. Yeah. No. I mean, you've got Boris's cycling agenda, and there's a lot of, you know, talk about that. But when it comes down to redesigning any of these roads to make life easier for cyclists, for example. Um, we haven't seen anything happen at all. And we've struggled for years to try to get more cycle parking here as an alternative to for people coming down to the shops by car. Because this is Putney Exchange, part of this thing here. And it's got a car park on the roof. And the council recently gave planning permission for that to be expanded and another 50 parking spaces. 
So this is at the same time that we're, you know, we're, we're working with them to get TfL to clean up the buses. You know, they're creating hundreds more car journeys into an already congested high street. So, but you know, they see there's a business imperative and that was it. So, you know, we are up against a lot of entrenched thinking. Um, one practical issue, did you have any uh, tubes nicked or tampered with at all? A big one. Did, it, did any, any tubes get uh, stolen or yes. tampered with? Yeah, they did. Yeah, yeah. we had, uh, if you look at the map, there, were, there was one here was stolen. Um, we, we put all these uh, on lamp posts, mostly on lamp posts, uh, up here where people couldn't reach them. But this one was slightly lower down and it just vanished. And there was another one we had somewhere out here, which we put down at, at you know, sort of toddler level. That went as well, which is a shame because we would have liked to have seen that. And I think we probably made one or two mistakes in terms of location, because we should have had another one on the high street. And this one that was one floor up and 20 yards back, you know, should have been right next to the bus garage. You know, so a few things like that, I think we probably have got better. And I think one or two residents here, so you've got different, very different readings in the same street. You know, I think that's, because, that's down to location. You know, people put it on their first floor balcony or whatever it is, you know, the, it's, it's, it's obviously going to be a different reading. Right. Um, can I ask you how long it took to put the tubes up and how many people were there doing that? We, uh, we emailed everybody we could think of and we emailed people and told them to email other people. Um, and we, we have a monthly bulletin, the Putney Society, which goes out to its 1,500 members. Um, and we asked for volunteers. And I got 24 people who said that they would volunteer to help put all these things up. Um, and we agreed a date in September and uh, Louise Francis came along from, you know, with all the kit and somebody else there as well. Um, on the day, only 12 people turned up. It was a Saturday morning and we wanted to go shopping or something. So, you know, we didn't get as many as we hoped. Um, and, um, you know, and then it was just a question of giving people the instructions. And it, 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 very, it's very, very simple, as you say. I mean, it's just basically an upside-down test tube. Um, you know, and a lot of these here, these, this is a residential area. A lot of these people put them, you know, on a tree at the end of the garden or something as well as on, you know, a lamppost on the street. But, you know, this is obviously, you know, it, the prevailing wind's coming that way. There was no real problem. And they were there for a month. They were all there for a month, or four weeks, in fact. It was four weeks later on the Saturday, we tried to get all the volunteers to come bring these things back. There were even fewer people volunteered to bring them back. So we had to go round. In fact, it ended up with me and a couple of other people. And we went round and picked all these things up. And they all have to be numbered. And then you had, we had a map which showed the location of each numbered one because this was divided into squares by mapping for change and so each square had a number and the idea was to have two uh, sites in each square um, and we didn't quite manage that but you know then there was a sort of numbering exercise so that when the readings came back you knew which location it was which was quite important so you had 12 volunteers is that correct yeah, in the end, we showed up. Okay. Yes. There are 24 um, volunteers, but 12 failed to okay. show up. Okay, so 12, 12 people, and how long, how, was it a morning, three hours? Or yeah, I would hours? say it took a couple of hours. A couple of hours. Because, you know, there was somebody took a few away, and they said, yeah, I'll do my road. So, you know, one person did that one, that one, and that one. And you know, it didn't take them very long. All they needed was a step ladder and, uh, you know, strap the thing to a lamppost and that was sure. it. Sure. And, um, and we did tell the council because, you know, we were told that we ought to technically ought to get the council's permission to use their lampposts. Uh, and we wrote to the council and they knew we were doing all this and they never said no. Uh, and we didn't bother to trouble TfL. Um, but there was no problem in that score. Nobody, you know, we had no complaints about that. I have another question, but does anyone else want to ask anything? Well, this chap here, he and I spent three hours because, you know, we were basically doing all the ones that we hadn't gotten volunteers for. So 
you know, we'd probably do about half of it ourselves. Uh, and that's my personal home stepladder, which we carried around to do all this. But, you know, I mean, it wasn't too much. It wasn't, sure. it wasn't overwhelming. I mean, we were only doing 40, and they were all within half a mile of, you know, the, the, the centre. So it wasn't, it wasn't particularly onerous, actually. And how did those 12 volunteers know where to put them? And had you given them, uh, have you met with, had you met with them previously in a sort of training evening? Or did you have no, a sheet? Or no, we, there, there was a lot of email communication basically setting out, this is what we want you to do. This is the purpose of it. And this is what you'd like to do. Um, oh, and you'd already decided the sites anyway. So they well, we had the squares the and we wanted people, we asked oh, okay. people to volunteer for a square. Oh, okay. You know, put up two of these things in your square. So it was it was relatively easy. It was except the problem was that we had a lot of squares with no volunteers showed up, <laughs> and they tended to be you know the ones at the edges. So you know we had a lot of walking, but that was how we did it. And and people knew what they had to do, and you know to take the the tube off at one end and make sure that the open end was down and not at the top, because it would fill up with water otherwise. Um, you know, and all that sort of stuff. But I mean, that wasn't that wasn't very difficult. Sure. We and lost a couple of the tubes. Not, I don't mean lost in the sense of them being stolen, but um, in two cases, spiders made their homes in them, <laughs> and that ruined the data. <laughs> and in terms of um, disseminating the results, um, I know you said about the the Wandsworth uh, local paper. Did you um, leaflet houses in the area to say, we've measured the air in your street for pollution, yes. this is a result? we did so that in some cases, not all of them, you know, because most of this is main roads. But you know, the, the people in this road, which does have a problem, at least according to our monitoring, and it's unfortunate that there's a gap here because there was, that was one of the ones that was stolen. Uh, and that's Putney outside Putney Art School, as it happens. But uh, you know, we, we leafleted everybody. We gave them copies of the map and our press release, and, we, you know, and a membership application form. Shoved it through the letterboxes of you know, so everybody. Was in that, that a lot of leaflets? It, it seems. How many leaflets do you think there were in total that you? I don't know, maybe a couple of hundred. Yeah. I mean, once the thing. I mean, the the. You know, it was a single A4 sheet with this thing on one side and the press release on the other. How did you express it in a, uh, in a way that made sense to people? Um, I guess, do you think there was an understanding that there was pollution anyway and it was, it was kind of starting a conversation? Yeah, well, we'd had the public meeting and we'd written that up and it was in our bulletin and, you know, in fact, the... the the discussion about you know the effects of air pollution and how bad it was was in the bulletin several times so you know all of the people who read it were able to see that so you know we in terms of raising awareness I think we did about as much as we could we did send a copy of the press release um, I've even got a copy of it here we did send a copy of the press release to every head of every school in uh, Putney um, yes yeah, see here we are that's the thing on one side and the map on the other. Um, you want to have a look at that? Yeah. Um, Do you want to pass it around? And we got no responses from any of the schools, which was very disappointing, actually. We did get a response. If you, if you had a... The map was bigger. You would see over here you've got Roehampton, which is a, a sort of separate community, but, you know, we're the... Um, Minister Society for Roehampton and Putney, as it happens. Uh, Putney, uh, Roehampton's also in Justin Greening's constituency. Um, <coughs> and you know, there's a couple of schools there that are on Roehampton Lane, which is, which is a, at least as busy as this road. I mean, it's another red route, and it's, it's incredibly busy and congested. Uh, but Roehampton University got quite involved in this, because they had people who were very interested in this subject and they wanted to do their own survey and what they were wanting to do was to get hold of some of these tubes uh, and, and engage with local schools so that you know they you know, I don't know whether they did it in the end but that was their plan 
so we did get, you know, we did have a good dialogue with them. They were quite helpful. But we were a bit disappointed, really, that the schools weren't more concerned or didn't share our concern. Do you think that was the... Is that because the teachers weren't... Uh, uh, do you think they hear what the teachers heard what you're saying, or do you think the parents, or... It sounds like it wasn't that important, because to you, I, mean, I don't know if this is true, the, you saw the council as really the main agent for change, in yes. terms of the main lever. Yes, but we, we had hopes that if the council started hearing from head teachers saying we're concerned because this is not good for the kids, that that would be another separate voice, and the more directions that the message was coming from to the council, the more likely that they're actually going to listen to somebody. But as I said, the schools didn't do that. The university did, but not, not none of the local schools. And what month did you put the tubes up, uh, by Se the way? September. September. So it ran through September and into the beginning of October. Did you um, did you think, uh, I mean, the, the pollution levels of nitrogen dioxide are seasonal to a certain extent. Did that influence your decision about when to start, or... Was it just more? Was the convenience to you the main thing? Uh, well, I suppose it was convenience. I mean, we had we had this public meeting where we announced that we were going to do it in April, um, and we wanted to do it fairly quickly so that we could, you know, get the results back and you know initiate a, com a campaign on the back of it, you know, with a view to the elections which were the following May. So we didn't want to leave it till the winter because we thought that would be too late. Uh, so in, in terms of timing, that was really what was driving it. I mean, it wasn't a seasonal thing, you know, like the air pollution would be worse in summer than winter or, or, or the other way around. I don't actually know whether there's seasonal differences. From what I understand from these monitors, which are there permanently, there isn't much seasonal variation. There's a daily variation, but it relates to traffic. So your campaign as a whole um, uh, took about a year, really. Um, yeah, I mean, it's still running in a way because yeah. you know we are still writing to the council saying you know what are you going to do you know what are you going to do next because we want more cycle parking we want some uh, you know restrictions we want to turn some parking spaces into cycle parking but they don't want to do that um, and um, you know we're you know we're trying various things but it's uh, you know so the campaign and we would like to do this particulates monitoring as a separate exercise. If only then we hope that the publicity we can generate all over again. But we haven't got to that yet. So, so just that just as, a, as an aside, sorry, just to, because uh, it's quite important, this, the, you know, this monitoring, these things are here permanently. Um, there were two days when they measured virtually zero pollution. And the reason was, was that this road was closed for the Olympic cycle race. So there was no traffic. So, you know, if that doesn't tell you where the stuff's coming from, nothing does. And it was quite remarkable. You could see a graph. You could see it all going along the normal way. And then it goes right the way down to almost zero and then back up again as soon as they reopen the road. It's quite remarkable. We've got the London Marathon we're running for our patch, which is dismissed again. Well, we've got another cycle race, actually, um, in August. It come, they, they're doing a slightly different route, but they are coming down the high street. So we'll have, you know, another day's... Uh, being saved from it. Sorry, were you going to ask something else? I just, just thought I'd get that out before I forgot. I was going to say, um, so the, the really, this sounds like the council became more active on this issue because of your work. And that, yeah, I think so, yes. And then, and then that perhaps, do you think it prioritised your route for the hybrid buses which produce less pollution or do you think which is now would have happened anyway. But well, we were, I'm sure you know, TfL is, having, is, is upgrading the whole of its bus fleet, and there's 8,000 buses, so we were told. Um, you know, and you can't replace them that quickly. Um, but I think all we did was we got them to prioritise this, you know, the routes on, on the high street ahead of some of the others. And that was purely on the grounds of publicity. And that was, you know, the council were pushing that. And, um, you know, our MLA, London Assembly member, was um, pushing that as well. So, 
you know, but that was, you know, that was partly the publicity and partly, you know, the, the looming elections. I have one more question, but is anyone... <laughs> Do you think more people became active on this issue after the publication of this, uh, of your work, of the, of the pollution monitoring, or... Do you think it's made much difference? I mean, it's had some success in well, some ways. It's certainly made difference in terms of you know the the TfL bringing the buses in. Um, I think I think it's fair to say that people are more aware of it, and the press is. I think the press more generally is taking a greater interest in air pollution issues, and this is you know another sort of body of evidence that that there's a real problem. So I think it's helped in that way a little bit. And um, this this sits within the, the Putney Society, do you think, or do you think it's almost a separate group? Or if you had to sort of try and sort of imagine you were drawing a Venn diagram of sort of overlapping, sort of, I don't know, social groups or involvement or something, then um, are they ex exclusively Putney Society members? Are they the volunteers? I'm just trying to get a picture. The, the volunteers of, were. And, you know, if you, in sort of demographic terms, the Putney Society is sort of uh, middle-class, middle-aged people, generally speaking, you know, in a reasonably affluent suburb. I mean, that's most of our members. But, you know, we've engaged with Wandsworth Living Streets and the Wandsworth Environmental Forum, and, you know, they helped us with this thing, and that's a different demographic, basically. Um, but, you know, getting this message over to you know, the population as a whole is, is quite difficult because there's very few mediums available. You know, there's a local website which has a sort of discussion forum which is actually quite lively. And I've started little threads on this thing several times on air pollution. Um, and, you know, it keeps going. But it, it, you know, it's not kind of generated a great sort of upsurge. It's just a few people who are interested in the subject who will respond to it. And there's some guy who's a, an automotive engineer, and he keeps writing these incredibly sort of critical things, saying, well, it's not just cars. You know, you can't be, you're anti-car. You know, and it's, no, that's not true. Uh, but, you know, he's sort of protecting, you know, I think, he, I think he's actually a stooge for you know, Toyota or something like that. <laughs> Those rail lines, they're, they're all electric, aren't they? They're, they're not diesel? Yeah, yeah they're yeah. electric. That's, this is a tube, oh, okay. and that's, that's a, a, you know, a through commuter line. Yeah, this is electric. So there's no other source, and, and the river's not used much you know, in terms of traffic. I mean, there is a, a, a sort of river taxi thing that comes along, but I mean, it's, you know, that's not a source of pollution, I wouldn't have thought. And after, after the publication of the, the results of the monitoring, um, were there groups or that invited you to come and uh, give a presentation? Oh, people or? like you, you mean? Well, I mean, <laughs> I mean, I was thinking more about in, in the, the local community in Wandsworth. Um, well, I suppose, yes, I mean... <laughs> well, none of the schools. I'm you know, really disappointed that the schools have not shown the slightest interest in this issue at all. Why, why do you think the schools are important? Well, because, uh, because if, they've got, if the kids start to learn about it, They'll nag their parents, and the parents will take an interest. And you know, it, it's a very good way to get messages out. Um, and we've tried to do it through the council as well. Uh, you know, and the council has some you know active travel plans at each school. Is trying to get people to bring their kids, you know, walk the kids to school or do it on bikes rather than you know drive 300 yards in a in a four by four. Um, but. I don't, you know, I think that would be a good way to really get the message over because I think if kids start to understand these issues and, you know, you can put it over in, you know, understandable way to, you know, kids of just about any age, you know, they'll nag their parents, you know, you know mummy, mummy, why, you know, why are we walking along this road with all this busy traffic, you know, that sort of thing. Uh, and, you know, it, I think it would definitely uh, have an effect.